Last week, we uh, began a conversation on, on healthy boundaries in our lives, and uh, I was surprised by the amount of um, input I got after last week, the emails and the Facebook posts that I received, and I thought to myself, hmm, maybe I'm not the only one struggling with unhealthy boundaries. You know, it's good to know I'm among friends uh, around there. And so lots of you asked me about the book that I mentioned last week, this book called Boundaries by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. If you notice on your message map at the very bottom, I've got the name of the book and even the Amazon website where you can get it. I think I got mine for like eight bucks um, on Amazon. But this conversation on boundaries for us started with a conversation on, on the paradox of boundaries out of Galatians chapter 2. And where we tried to figure out what it means that we are at the same time supposed to carry each other's burdens and yet carry our own load. And how do we do that at the same time? And the, the paradox of boundaries is being able to figure out the difference and the, the dynamic between carrying each other's burdens and carrying each other's load. Well, today I want to talk about another paradox, another place where uh, we wrestle with boundaries, and this is the paradox of humanity. And I find this in, uh, named out in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Listen to what Timothy says. It says, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Power love, and self-discipline. And I've wrestled with that concept of power because it's in that word where I find this, this paradox. And, and here's what I mean, that we as human beings are at the same time, we are hopelessly powerless and we are ultimately powerful. Let me say that again so you don't miss that, because that's critical to understanding these boundaries that we are called to live there. At the same time, we are hopelessly powerless and ultimately powerful. And so the challenge of healthy boundaries is to know the difference, to be able to find the, the crease between the, where I'm powerful and where I'm powerless, and to draw those boundaries, those healthy boundaries, right in between those two. So if I had to diagram it out, here's what it might look like. On a spectrum of, of my life, there is a place here in the middle where God has empowered us, where we have the power to affect change, where we have the ability to, to, to make things happen. And this is this place of healthy boundaries. Our problem comes in when we try to live outside of that place in the place where God is supposed to exist, in a place where God has power and we do not. And so figuring out this dynamic between healthy boundaries is about power. Where do I have power and where am I powerless? Now, in this conversation, some of you in the room are going to really resonate with the word powerless. There are some of you who, through life experiences, through your own personalities, through your own context, some of you who, who will really resonate with the word powerless. You know, there are situations in your lives that have caused you to feel without power. Um, you, maybe you use words like trapped or victimized or kept down. Or, and so some of that language will really resonate with you. And if that's where you're coming from today, I want to really encourage you to pay close attention where we start talking about the place where we are ultimately powerful because God has a word for you in that section. If you're like me and you're kind of a type A kind of, uh, you know, uh, the, the word powerless doesn't really resonate with you. You really resonate more with the word powerful. You're a, maybe you're a control freak like me and you think you have power over everything, which is why your boundaries are terrible, right? If you're like me, then the, you're going to resonate with the word powerful more than you're going to resonate with the word powerless. And so Here's your chance to pay real close attention because I think God has a word for you like God has a word for me. And here's what I've learned about power being powerless, that there are three key areas of my life where I have had to come to terms with the fact that I am ultimately and hopelessly powerless. And so are you. And here's the first one. 
First place where I am ultimately and hopelessly powerless is I am powerless over my past. You are powerless over your past. The truth is yesterday is gone. Maybe that's an amen, hallelujah. Maybe it's a boo-hoo, I'm sad. But yesterday is over. There are no comebacks. There are no do-overs. No matter how hard you try, you can't fix it. You can't change it. You can't relive it. Yesterday is gone. It is what it was. So our reality is that we are hopelessly powerless to change our past. The Bible talks a lot about this. And in Philippians, it says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it. But one thing I do, here's Paul saying, a priority I place is forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's good news, isn't it? In Isaiah chapter 43, this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And God says to God's own people, listen to this, forget the former things and don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. You do not perceive it. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Church, our reality is, is that we are hopelessly powerless over our past. And the good news of that is, is that all of your sin is in the past. Hear that. All of your sin, even the sin you just committed 10 seconds ago when you were judging that person sitting next to you, right? All of your sin is in the past. I had a friend who I used to work with who every morning I'd say, hey, how's it going? And she would say, all new day, all new chances. That's a healthy boundary, right? Putting your past behind you. Over the last several months, I've been working on building a relationship with the Alcoholics Anonymous community that comes here every Thursday. Fabulous, powerful community. Um, there are over 150 to 200 people that jam-pack themselves into John Wesley Hall every Thursday night to work on recovery, accountability, to love one another, to hold each other up, and to, and to work on their sobriety. And I, the more I hang out with folks in AA, the more convinced I am that the church has a lot to learn from the AA community, because and, and we're, we're all in recovery from something. And so in the community of recovery, there are 12 steps, and the very first step is that we have admitted we are powerless over alcohol and that our lives have become unmanageable. Do you see the first step in recovery? And like I said, we're all in recovery from something unless you're doing this boundaries thing perfectly. The first step in recovery is to admit that I'm powerless over my sin. I'm powerless over my past. And the problem is we don't like to admit things like that because we don't like to give up power. Most of us are more control freak than we like to admit, let's be honest. But the good news is we're in good company. In the Bible, there's this guy named Paul. And Paul was kind of a Jesus rock star. He wrote like two-thirds of the New Testament. I mean, if there's anybody who was, who was just getting it right, it was Paul. And in Romans chapter 7, I want you to listen to what Paul writes about his own sin and his own past. Listen to this. This is fab fabulous. It says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, that's what I do. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. What a wretched person am I who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Can you feel Paul's frustration? Can you feel his anxiety? Can you feel his powerlessness? Why do I do the things that I don't want to do and the things that I want to do I don't do? Why, why does this keep happening? And Paul gets frustrated. And he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because at the end of the day, that's the only answer we have. 
the end of the day, it's Jesus. I don't care what your particular addiction is, whether it's alcohol or sex or drugs or relationships or anxiety or whatever your particular addiction is. We are powerless over our past. And the only answer is Jesus. And here's the boundary problem that we struggle with. We like to spend way too much time in our lives trying to fix our past for which we have no help with. We are hopelessly powerless to change it. And I know you're sitting out here thinking, oh, not me, Pastor Dave, I don't do that. And I'm here to tell you, yes, you do. We all do. And here's how. Every time we fall into the trap of guilt, shame, and fear, we are intentionally trying to exercise power over our past. When we fall into the get trap of guilt, shame, and fear, what we're trying to do is manage our history. And so here's the way it often looks. There's that little voice in the back of your head that says, if I can just feel guilty enough about my past, maybe that'll make up for it. And we try to play the penance game. Or we tell ourselves, if I can just live in the purgatory of, of shame long enough and allow it to guide my life and my decisions, then perhaps that'll make, answer some of the reasons why I've done some of the things I've done in the past. And we let shame guide us. Or we say, you know what, if I can just live in fear, I'll spend my whole life looking backwards rather than moving forwards. And every time we do that, we're trying to fix a history and a past that cannot be changed. Church, if you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. Guilt, shame, and fear are never, ever from God. Somebody write that down. You're going to need that someday. Guilt, shame, and fear are never from God. Those are not tools that God uses to guide God's own people. Accountability, yes. Discipline, for sure. Absolutely. But never guilt, shame, and fear. This is why in 1 Timothy it says power, love, and self-discipline, not guilt, shame, and fear. Guilt, shame, and fear are about control. Power, love, and self-discipline are about freedom. So if you're experiencing guilt, if you're caught in the trap of shame, if you're stuck in a cycle of fear, I want you to know that you are living outside of healthy boundaries that God has placed for you. Trying to fix a past that cannot be fixed. Trying to change something that Christ himself paid for. Some of us have been living in that trap for so long that it might take some help for us to dig out of that hole. So I just want to encourage you, if that's where you are today, that is outside of healthy boundaries. Now, it's not that we don't learn from our past. I think we absolutely do. Paying attention to our past is, is critical or we end up repeating it over and over and over again. But we have to come to the place where we can say, though I can learn from my past, I cannot change it. And I'm going to draw a hard boundary. You know what I mean by a hard boundary, right? There's a difference between a hard boundary and a soft boundary. A soft boundary is the place where you say, I'm not going to do that, but I probably will. Right? We all have those. A hard boundary is I'm not going to do that. Not only am I not going to do that, not only am I not going to go there, but there's going to be accountability in place. There are, I'm going to have people who are going to help me. There's going to be people who are going to call me on it if I, if I try to get near there. There's going to be things in my life that is going to keep me from stepping across that boundary. So we're going to place a hard boundary and refuse to get sucked into the trap of trying to relive our past. Another place we are absolutely and hopelessly powerless over is other people's future. You've all heard it. You can't change other people, right? You can only change yourself. 
You know, you can't change other people. We, have, we don't have the power to do that. And if I've heard it once, I've heard it a million times. People coming into relationships saying, well, well, I can change her or I can fix him. Some of you are laughing because you've been there. The reality is no amount of love, no amount of reason, no amount of threat, no amount of punishment will ever be able to change someone who does not choose change for themselves. That's it. Proverbs 26, the book of Proverbs, has got to be one of my favorites. So practical. Proverbs 26 says, Like one who grabs a stray dog by the ears is someone who rushes into a quarrel, not their own. Isn't that great? What happens when you grab a stray dog by the ears? You get bit, right? How many of us have been bit by trying to change someone's future for them, right? Don't raise your hands. We all know who we are. Peter says this. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. You know what a meddler is? Someone who tries to change someone else's future. Interesting to me that Peter puts meddler in the same sentence with murderer and thief. I'm just saying. (laughs) We are hopelessly powerless to change other people's future. But we can influence. Because I know some of you are sitting there thinking, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to be changing other people's future, making disciples, changing the world? We do that through influence. First Thessalonians, Paul tells the church there to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you. But here's why. So that, don't miss this, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anyone. See, the difference between influencing people and trying to change people is the healthy boundary that recognizes that we are responsible to one another, not for one another. Check that, church. We are responsible to one another, not for one another. I know as your pastor, as much as I want to, I am hopelessly powerless to change your heart, to change your mind, to change your actions, to change your faith. I am hopelessly powerless to change your future. Only you and God can do that. But, but, I can change me, right? I can change me. And the good news is that most of the time, changing me is enough to influence you and influence and change the world. So we're going to draw a hard boundary between trying to change other people's future because we're hopelessly powerless to do it. So we're powerless to change our own past. We're powerless to change other people's future. We are thirdly powerless to change God's present. Here's what I mean by that. God is sovereign. God is God all by God's self, and God doesn't need our help to be God. Can I get an amen, church? All right, as much as we like to help God, right? God doesn't need our help. God is going to do what God is going to do. Psalm 115 says this, Our God is in heaven. God does whatever pleases God. Proverbs 16 says, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. So we are hopelessly powerless to change God's presence, to tell God what to do. Now, it doesn't mean we don't try, right? I mean, and we do it all the time. Hey, God, I got this really great idea. If you could just get on board with it, that'd be great. Right? Hey, God, I'm working over here. If you could just bless the things I'm doing rather than asking me to do your things, that'd be awesome. Right? Hey, God, if you could just follow me rather than me having to follow you, that would be excellent. Don't we try to tell God what to do all the time? 
And yet we got to recognize that God is God all by God's self and doesn't need our help. This October, I'm going to be offering a membership class here. So anybody who's interested in being a, a member here at Shiloh Church can, uh, can be a part of this. And one of the things I teach in our membership class is the oldest creed in the church. And the creed is three simple words. Jesus is Lord. That's it. Jesus is Lord. And we talk about what it means and, and that I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to live into Jesus is Lord. Because if Jesus is Lord, not just buddy, not just co-pilot, not just friend, but if Jesus is Lord of my life, that means Jesus owns everything, has ultimate authority in every single area, my finances, my relationships, everything. Jesus is Lord. But I've always thought that that's kind of the first half of a longer sentence. Because if we're going to be really honest by saying Jesus is Lord, here's how we got to finish that sentence. We got to be willing to say Jesus is Lord and I am not. Because it can't be both ways. Jesus is either Lord over it all or he's not. We don't share thrones. Let me try something. See if this works here in this room. God is good. And all the time. Okay, you guys know the thing. All right, so here's my question. If that whole God is good all the time thing and all the time God is good thing, if that's more than just a bumper sticker or some brainwashing technique we use at church, if that's more than that, if it's really truth, then the good news of God is good all the time is the fact that I don't have to try to play God because God is already good. And the only thing I do by trying to play God is mess up the good stuff God has planned for me already. I can trust God. In Romans 8, Paul says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, be clear, Paul is not saying all things are good, right? Tragedy happens. Sin is real. The devil is a liar, right? You know, there are real issues in the world. What Paul here is saying is that if God is good and if Jesus is Lord, then we can trust God to take every situation in our lives, the good ones and the bad ones, and bring good out of them. This is how good God is. And not only is God good, but we are hopelessly powerless to change how good God is and to change how God feels about us. The Bible tells us that I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels or demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ that is in Jesus our Lord. So we draw a hard boundary at telling God what to do and at forgetting how much God loves us. So we are hopelessly powerless over our past, over other people's future, and over God's present. But that doesn't mean we're powerless people. So for those of you who are resonating a little bit with that word powerless, I want you to tune in extra close now because I'm about to share with you a word that could change your life. That we are, because of Christ, ultimately powerful. That on our own, perhaps, we are powerless. But because of Christ, we are ultimately powerful. Jesus, right before he ascended into heaven in, in Acts chapter 1, he gathers the disciples and he makes them a promise. And not just to those 12 disciples, but to anyone throughout history who's ever called themselves a disciple of Jesus Christ, God, Jesus makes this promise, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The, that word for power in the Greek is it's dynamos, which is where we get our word dynamite from. 
So this power that Jesus is talking about isn't just the power to make it or the power to exist or the power to drag myself through the day. This is the power to blow things up. This is the power to explode into the world. This is the power to change everything. The kind of power that is available to us is mind-blowing through the Holy Spirit. The power found in Christ is very different than the power we find in the world or the so-called power in the world. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking about a, a place in his life where he's feeling very powerless. He's got this thorn in his side and God says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul responds, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. I delight in hardships and in insults and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, say it with me, then I am strong. See, power in Christ looks different and church, I just want you to know that no matter how powerless you might feel from time to time, that because of Christ, you have been given incredible power. We have, because of Christ, we have the power to confess. James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a, of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You know the old phrase, confession is good for the soul, not just because it feels good, but because there's power in it. Holy Spirit power as we confess and pray for one another. Because of Christ, we have the power to submit. James 4, 7 says, uh, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And I know in our worldly minds, we think of submission as not powerful. But in God's world, submission to God is the most powerful thing you can do. It's so powerful that the devil can't even stand in the same room with you. There's power in submission. Because of Christ, we have the power to repent. Repent. Acts 3.19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that a time of refreshing may come to the Lord. That word repent literally means to turn around, to do something different, to change things, to break those cycles of addiction, to break those habits, to break the chains that have held you down for so long. Because of Christ, we have the power to do that. Because of Christ, we have the power to ask for help. The power to come to God and say, God, we need help from you. Matthew 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. We're not alone in this thing. We haven't been left to fend for ourselves. God said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Finally, for me, the single most powerful force in the universe, I believe, is the power that we have in Christ to forgive and to be forgiven. It's the most powerful force there is, and folks, it is also the most underutilized. We forget there's so much power in forgiveness. Colossians says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Church, because of Christ, we are not powerless. We are not hopeless. We are not weak. We are not victims. The Bible describes us as more than conquerors because of Christ, because of the work God is doing in there. So I draw a hard boundary in letting anyone steal or diminish the power that Christ has given the power that is available to me. Romans 8.31 says, If God is with us, who can be against us? Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What kind of things? All things. 
So when will the church move from a position of fear and scarcity to a position of courage and abundance, living out the power Christ has given us? When will God's people recognize the strength and the courage that we've been given in Christ? When will you and I live the abundant lives, ultimately power-filled lives that God's calling us to live? And stop playing victim. At the end of AA, every week they uh, say a prayer together. And the prayer they say together is called the serenity prayer. Some of you may know it. Some of you may have never seen it before. It's a really powerful prayer. It goes a little something like this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, to understand where I'm powerless. Give me the courage to change the things I can, to know where I'm powerful, and the wisdom to know the difference. Boundaries. Boundaries. 